be natted for a while. Uh, well, thank you, <coughs> thank you to the Keres County Self Help Group for this invitation to come and present um, some of our clinical activities at Moorfields and Oxford Eye Hospital. Mostly this afternoon, you'll be pleased to hear it's uh, more related to contact lenses. So. John has um, already given you all the, the details, gory and good, about corneal transplant, so I don't feel I need to dwell upon those any further. I was, um, there may have been one or two that I might have put in had it not been for that, but I'd be pleased to know that I've hoiked them out. Now this is, um, actually I have changed the order of this slightly, partly because of John's discussion, and um, he was talking about some of these conditions. I'm sure they didn't mean all that much to you, but um, you may be interested to know that uh, I have some nice slides of profiles, and I thought I'd just put these in corneal profiles, that is, to illustrate some of these different types of what we call keratoconus. And <coughs> we've, um, we think that keratoconus is something of a misnomer, and a better name for it would be a, a more accurate description of the condition, which is an ectasia. Now, this means that the cornea thins and becomes distended in sometimes quite an irregular fashion. And we're trying to promote this idea that, um, that keratoconus is not the right name, but a primary cornea ectasia, there could be a secondary for some reason, for example, after post-LASIK on normal myopic eyes, might develop a kind of ectasia which would be secondary. But the keratoconus, which we come to describe, is more of a primary one. And we split them into these three groups, and it de largely defines the shape of, of the profile. Can you, can you see that? It's very bright from my angle here. Is that okay? This, this for example, is... Um, is a, a central cone apex, as you can see. The apex is just, it's not particularly steep profile, but the apex is right along the visual axis. Not particularly difficult to fit with contact lenses either. It's fairly regular on the visual axis and symmetrical about those axes, about the, about the visual axis. Here's one which, much the same, but a considerable more degree of distension about it, but still very much with the apex in a similar place. And one more, which could be called the Cone of the Week Award, I should imagine that one. And they do present something like this. And again, a very central cone apex, but with very much more advanced distension. But they're not all quite as symmetrical as that, but we still call them keratoconus. And, and the, one of the features which is classically described in, in, the, in, uh, in the, the diagnosis of keratoconus is steep corneal readings when it comes to the radius. But if you measure this one on the visual axis, quite obvious that this is not steep at all. In fact, it's quite a flat profile here. At that point there, which is well off the visual axis, is quite steep. So you would describe this one as an eccentric apex, but with a minimal distension. But it doesn't bear the slightest resemblance to a cone, not at all. In fact, John's expression this morning of a droopy boob, I think, was uh, more appropriate. Or did he, use, he might use bosom, mightn't he? Yeah, sorry about that. Yes. And here's another one, the droopy boob type of cone, and even more so in this case. And again, look at this central visual axis here. It's not um, steep at all. In fact, if you look at it very carefully, I think you might agree that it's actually concave on the visual axis and sloping as well. And it's this uh, slope which sometimes causes the problem. Again here, more of a, you could say, a, a pot-bellied businessman, I suppose, if you like. And again here with a cone apex nearly at, the visual, uh, nearly at the limbus rather than at the visual axis. This one, even more so, that's just distended even more and swollen out, but more in this, this portion just here. Now would you call this one, the clinicians amongst us would be call this one a keratoconus or a keratoglobus, because it's very spherical on the visual axis. Well, when you compare it to that one, I think that makes the decision on the previous one. This was a little girl from Belgrade who came over to England about three or four years ago when she was then 12. And as John was talking about corneal transplants the other day, she very sadly had a transplant in the fellow eye, which was very similar to this one. They usually come in a matching pair. And transplant was not very successful because it had to be almost as big as the whole cornea. And this uh, puts the, these limbal arcades, which you can see the arcade vessels, it puts the transplant in close proximity to the arcades and increases risk of rejection. So it's a completely bad idea. 
and this one was sent over to England for another corneal transplant. But fortunately, she encountered somebody who knew better than that and referred them to our contact lens unit and we fitted her with scleral lenses. You can fit anything with scleral lenses, including a really distended shape like this. So this was a very good achievement to do this. We gave her a lens on her 13th birthday, which I thought was the nicest birthday present she could have had, and she saw quite well with it. Now this one, not globic at all, but the interesting feature of this is not so much the cornea, but the reflection of the ceiling light filament, the little kink in it just there, you can see, and half of it just there. If I put that into high magnification, a little closer, you can just see how irregular this surface is on the visual axis. So although not particularly distended, this is an exceptionally difficult one to fit or to improve in terms of visual gain, even with a contact lens. Again, this is another one which I actually saw in my practice. If you look here at this, this uh, the main distension here is localized to this portion just below the, visual, uh, below the pupil margin nearly. On the visual axis itself, again, you can see that it's very nearly convec uh, concave in shape. Now, these represent some really difficult shapes in order to get a visual improvement. So it's not necessarily a function of the distension. So we go back to the globic cornea. Sometimes what determines the vision is these subtle irregularities, which are not really visible from, from the side even. And so when you look at a person who has an eye like this, it's very difficult for anybody else to, to rationalize quite why it is that this person doesn't see very well. And because I appreciate fully uh, things that uh, Gareth was saying earlier about uh, activities at work, and it's fairly obvious that when you're looking at an otherwise perfectly, or usually perfectly healthy person, but severely disabled by this eye condition, I can quite understand how you can feel quite isolated when, uh, when nobody quite understands. Why don't you wear your glasses? I'm sure you'd all like a fiver for every time someone said that to you. And I don't think the situation's getting an awful lot better. So we have to try to improve the situation somehow. Now, when I came to the, um, the Keratokona self-help self group AGM a couple of years ago, I just gave a little presentation about this kind of thing, not quite to the extent of this, but I made a discussion about it. And I'd asked, asked a question at that date, and I'd asked those people who were there to not take part in this discussion, but well, maybe I'll come on to this, I'll come back to these ones later. I want to start this discussion I'll come back to those, those corneal and scleral lens fitting pictures later. I just wanted to bring you in on this. Those people who are there at that meeting, perhaps you could refrain from, this, from joining in this discussion, but perhaps you can have some audience involvement here. What do you think is the single highest priority for the UK self-help keratoconus group? Any offers, the single, single one highest priority? So I'm interested to see whether it's the same as what I think it is. Any offers? Pardon? Vision. Vision. Sure, yeah. But achieving that. What can, you, what can you do as a group? You can't magic the disability away. So how do you achieve that vision? Pardon? Share information. Yeah, OK. So I didn't hear that. Better understanding yeah, which is what I mentioned earlier. All the part and parcel of the information. But it's not what I have in mind. Support. support. Moral. Moral support. So, yes, it's relating to other people and bringing them in on board and help and them understanding why you have such a problem. Yes, but it's still not the one I have in mind. Very high priorities, but not the one I think it should be. Sanjay? Get the, get the authorities to do something more. And what else did you say? Well, the cheaper, quicker. Cheaper, quicker. Sanjay's got it. Sanjay's hit my priority. Amy? Pardon? Promote best practice. Well, it's all part of information, isn't it? Information, there's lots of information around. If you key in keratoconus on the web, there's thousands of entries. Some of them are very good and some of them are very bad. So information 
is, is good thing to have, but it's not necessarily the highest priority because you can be befuddled with information. There was a discussion earlier about information, informed consent about transplants and anything else. If you have too much information, you can't assimilate it. So you have to have good information, so therefore you have to distinguish between good and bad information, which is not that easy. Rosemary? <laughs> right. Yes, we go. She didn't hear that one from the back. Rosemary was saying, uh, so that the medics and practitioners are more aware of, of uh, your your problems in living with it, and we and you cease to become a pair of eyes sitting there in the chair. Yes, well, I entirely agree with that. But they're not necessarily that. They're all priorities. But Sanjay touched upon the number one single highest priority, which is. Above all, the way I see it, is to improve the delivery of all the non-invasive management options. And Sanjay hit upon that in, in a different way by saying cheaper, quicker lenses. And that's what I think you should be looking for as your number one priority. Because we can develop surgical procedures, and we do, and we can make surgical procedures quite quick, and we do that too, actually. In the USA, you can talk yourself into a transplant, you'll be on the list that week. One of the reasons for that is that they have a system of, tra of transplant donation which says, we will take your bits and pieces unless you say we can't. In this country, we tend to have a, a system which says, we'll take your bits and pieces if you say we can, and that's quite a different way of doing it. In fact, the US sometimes have nearly out of sell by date corneas, which they give away to other countries. They have perfectly good corneas, and they're within their sell by date, <laughs> but only just. And they're not good enough for the delicate American cornea, of course, so they can go elsewhere. But that's another matter. But certainly the facility is there to make things happen very fast. So why can this not be the case with contact lenses, one says, or, or any other non-invasive options? But contact lenses is the only non-invasive option, really. If you see well enough with spectacles to deal with your keratoconus, then I'd be inclined to say that's a subclinical keratoconus and of not that great a consequence, because you're managing and seeing and holding down your job with something that you can have made up in two days without any trouble at all. And you don't have to go through the hospital eye service to achieve that. But contact lenses, to look at the best option or the second best option or the third best option, any option, and alternate between the two even, and to sort that out and come to an end point, which is either that you're successful with your lens wear or that you establish that you're not successful with your lens wear and then move on to something else. But absolute imperative is to make that happen quickly. And as Gareth was, was uh, and um, Matt were referring to the Australian uh, situation. The insurance companies are not particularly supportive of all of this. Why not? Because they don't want to be. They're very good at taking their money off us for premiums, but they're not that good when it comes to delivering the goods and paying for perfectly justified costs. Matt also touched upon optometrists and medics' fees for contact lenses. It's uh, always fairly easy to poke um, accusations at practitioners of all kinds, but the truth of the matter is it costs an absolute fortune to deliver medical services. And that applies whether it's in the hospital eye service or in private practice. All of, these, all of the costs have to be covered. In the private sector, as I've said in a posting I put in your discussion group recently, every last tissue paper has to be accounted for, and this is a fact. And it's something we have to do to recognise that it's really worthwhile to meet these costs and to put people back on the road again. And therefore, to improve the delivery and make no delays on delivery of the non-invasive services, to me, is the obvious and single priority above all everything else which you need to be working towards. And somehow or another, we have to achieve this. And it could be that we need more training of practitioners, more information for certain, but we already have a lot of information around. There's just heaps of it. There's so much information, it's just becoming impossible to sift it all out. But that's why I see as my number one priority. So there are some... So how do we achieve that? Are there ways that we can improve the current situation? Um, feel free, incidentally, to just interrupt if you want to. No, it doesn't really have to be just me, because this is trying to generate a discussion here. So if you want to say anything, just say it. And if I don't hear, perhaps I'll ask you to say it again, but I'll then repeat your question, and everyone else can discuss this. I don't mind whether they get through my slides or not. I have about 
thousand, I should imagine, and I don't think I'll get through all of them this afternoon unless we hire the hall for tomorrow as well, which is a possibility. But, so just interrupt if you have anything to contribute. So firstly, looking at, in particular, the contact lens applications, because I think we covered the medical today to, uh, to its destruction virtually, I should think. So here we're focusing in on the contact lenses. In this country, it's very much the optometry group which deals with the contact lenses. Not so, I might say, in some other countries where there is different systems. In France, for example, it seems to be illegal at the moment for optometrists to practice in contact lenses without the supervision of an ophthalmologist. And in other countries, optometrists just don't exist. In Brazil, they're illegal, as far as I can make out. In Italy, they can't decide amongst themselves, the optometrist that is, whether to have a three-year course, which is the case in Rome, or a one-year course, which is the case in Napoli. So they haven't even got their act together to see how long their course should be. So I don't really think there's very much chance of them being taken very seriously in the ophthalmology groups in those countries. UK is very different. We don't have a surfeit of ophthalmologists, and the ophthalmologists are by and large very pleased to dump the job of contact lenses onto optometrists, and it's part of their basic training, undergraduate training, as I've put on this slide. Features, or contact lenses feature as part of undergraduate training for optometrists. Roger, I think you'd agree that's not the case in ophthalmology, that contact lens practice does not feature for uh, part of the training in ophthalmology, does it, in, as, your, as the basic medical course? You would know perhaps what the front from the back is, would you? Or maybe not even that. Because ophthalmology features about two weeks in the medical course altogether, doesn't it? And it's only when you graduate as a medic that you choose to go into ophthalmology, let alone contact lenses. But with the optometry group in this country and Europe and US, most countries with a similar uh, type of, of qualification and education standard, it's an integral part of our training. But for keratoconus, I don't think so, because it's difficult enough to fit it all into the course or even to find keratoconus patients. So it doesn't feature as part of the undergraduate training, for, even for optometry. So the, most optometrists will go through their three years, even their training year, which is pre-registration year, uh, <coughs> without seeing a single keratoconus patient. And so the pre-registration year, would that apply? Again... I don't think so, because unless you have privileged enough, as I was, to work in Morfield's Eye Hospital in my pre-registration year, you wouldn't see a keratoconus patient there either. So it's very much a postgraduate qualification. Therefore, it becomes an issue where you choose to focus in on, on looking at a certain subject. And in the UK, because of our British Health Service, which supports our activities in contact lens practice when they're medically indicated, most of the work is channeled through the hospital eye service raises the question of can more be provided or more keratoconus be managed then in, outside the hospital, be say managed in the community or you could say if you like managed in the high street optometry practices, something of a derogatory term I'm told but that's I think everybody knows what I mean by that and there's a distinction between the hospital optometrists and those not in the hospital eye service. I'm a bit of both as a matter of fact which, which gives me a perspective on both of them. But there are some major issues which have already been touched upon with the financing. There are a lot of lenses involved dealing with keratoconus. We have mount sheets on our files at Moorfields and we have 12 stick-on labels we put on these. Some of them have up to 10 or 15 sheets, all with 10 or 12 orders for lenses on them over a period of a few years. It's an enormous number of lenses, and every lens has to be paid for by somebody. They don't grow on trees, and this is all part of the financing, so there's lots of lenses. And because they don't run smoothly, there's a lot of contact lens-induced or contact lens-associated complications, which are not necessarily the case with other kinds of contact lens practice. It also takes up a lot of chair time and a lot of aggravation generally, not necessarily because of, of anything else other than that keratoconus is not an easy condition to deal with. We have to accept complications which are contact lens induced or even part of the natural history of keratoconus which we would not accept in other groups of contact lens wearers. And so we have to relate to this as being acceptable complication rate. <coughs> so we can either stay as we are, which is Imagine about 95% of keratoconus in the UK is NHS clinics of some kind. Some, not necessarily within hospitals, but I think mentioned it's, that's about a, a, an accurate assessment. 
In the US, where they don't have a comparable NHS that we do here, most of it is hived off into smaller units. Hence, they have multi-centre multi studies set up, whilst we can deal with that same number of people in one large centre when it comes to analysing results and outcome. So we can either maintain the status quo, or we can divert some of it into private optometry or medical practices. I say medical, optometry, stroke medical, that's because there are some medics who are interested in contact lenses in keratoconus, but actually very few. I mean, it's very hard to think of more than a couple of dozen that are genuinely interested in taking on the fitting problems themselves. And you could say, why is there a need for them to do that? And I would be inclined to say, well, there isn't really, because there's other things, and in many ways, more focused activities that the medics should be attending to, such as maintaining transplants and aftercare from transplants and, and other things in general. It can be hived off to the optometry group, which is as well-trained as anywhere in, on the globe, I should imagine. But when you start looking at the financing situation, if we're going to move into private optometry or medical practice, then we have a few options to look at. There's health insurance. And we've touched upon health insurance a little so far, but my experience is that you're very unlikely to extract very much from the health insurance companies. As I say, they're very good at taking your fees from you, but not very good at delivering the goods. And even though you point out that the person with keratoconus can't see the fingers in front of your face without their lenses, and with their lenses can be a functional person, they still seem strangely disinterested in helping out in any way. So I don't think until they receive a kick in the appropriate place that they're going to contribute very much in the foreseeable future. So we have to be looking at some kind of independent resources, perhaps. Now, most people probably be able to finance their own contact lenses, I, sh I should think, in practice, especially against the background that if they wear their lenses, they go to work, and if they don't wear their lenses, they don't go to work. So very soon, you find yourself losing much more than, you would have, uh, than it would have cost you in terms of the contact lenses. So it could be that there's alternative sources of independent funding available. Now, as far as this is not so much the funding, but as whether private optometry practice is independent, it's not independent funding, independent in its own right, a kind of self-standing practice, as it were. Or it might be attached to a local eye unit, in which case it's not completely independent anyway. So you have this situation where if it's independent, then it will be available to anybody who wants to take on, or the expression was used earlier from Matt, dabbling in, in contact lens practice of keratoconus. I think not particularly a good thing to do that, I don't think. But attached to a local eye unit, well, that has advantages and disadvantages as well. The disadvantage here is that it excludes everybody else in that area. So one practice might have a very strong attachment to a local hospital, I know one or two where this is the case, but it's the only practice in the area where this happens and therefore there's no dissemination of further expertise apart from in that practice. So I don't think you gain all that much with that kind of situation compared to the situation in the hospital. There's also some potential for some kind of shared care. Now we're, we're doing this already with other eye conditions such as management of diabetes, for example, which has serious sight-threatening uh, potential and and it also can be controlled and treated in its early stages. So everybody's very interested in picking up the changes before they cause any serious blindness. But it causes, it generates quite a lot of, of work and quite a lot of backup. And this is being, and has been, successfully hived off to the community for supervision of diabetic retinopathy. And there are some other things as well. It's never done very much or to any great extent as far as, as keratoconus and contact lenses is concerned. It might be that there is some potential there too. But in order to do any of these, I think we have to have some kind of, of improvement in the way we train our, our practitioners. Go back to my, one of my very early slides in this discussion. We're looking at something which is distinctly a postgraduate exercise. So the optometry graduates, practitioners, have to make the effort to find out for themselves how to deal with this. If they sit in their practices and wait for keratoconics to come in, they'll wait forever. So they have to go and find it elsewhere. In the NHS, there's an advantage of collective experience, especially at Moorfields Eye Hospital, because we have open plan clinics. Open plan, open plan clinics, you could argue, have um, serious drawback that they're 
they're not particularly private. But they also have an advantage that they're not particularly private because you find yourself earwigging on the conversation going on in the next cubicle. And if you're discreet about it, you can say, actually, George, you know, you haven't thought of this option. Maybe you could bring that one back in again and have a look at this. You don't have to go barging in, but it is quite possible to, to learn things through glass walls or over the top of the glass partitions. If you have a separate room, all very nice and cosy, etc., but you don't actually share your experience with the other practitioners very much. So there's lots of advantages in the way we have our clinic set up at Moorfields compared to uh, sort of a... a it's a very uh, civilised individual room where you have a consultation with somebody. It's with that person, and it's very much more difficult to share it. And I think it's something to be said for that, especially in a teaching environment like Moorfields. So you have this easy practitioner interaction. You can just go to the next cubicle and say, oh, can you come and have a look at this? Or even if you're in the role of supervisor, you might take that initiative yourself and go into the next cubicle and, and, and interact. As John mentioned too this morning, there is the close contact with ophthalmology possible as well. This is back in the NHS clinics because you only have to go across the corridor and you can discuss the long-term outcomes. There are some implications with contact lenses when it comes to long-term management and you can't afford to let any contact lens-induced pathology jeopardise future transplant management, for example. And this is not a strong possibility, but it is a possibility. And if we have time, then I might be able to show you some illustrations of contact lens-induced pathology later on. Not it's anything that's likely to make anybody keel over this afternoon. Sorry, John. It's, um, I don't think they're that bad, but... Uh, <laughs> but um, something of, of some interest there. Ooh, get rid of that. Uh, so there is a good close contact with ophthalmology. There's also some disadvantages, of course, in the NHS clinic situation. Most of it is really bureaucratic, and you, you, you have a busy day in the clinic which starts at 9 and finishes at somewhere between 5 and 7 in the evening, and you don't always get around to doing things, and you have to hive off office jobs to other people on the staff. I mean, it's, it's the way it should be, but you sometimes find that that doesn't always happen. They don't, uh, the jobs don't always get done, but it certainly does make for an exceedingly bureaucratic system. Half the time the notes aren't there because they're in a different part of the hospital because somebody is taking them back to the file again. You can't keep them anywhere. It's very hard going, making a big dinosaur move fast and you have enough to do with your clinic day-to-day -day responsibilities to be able to try to improve things very much and it becomes for somebody else to improve the situation and because same old story they don't have keratoconus or any experience of the of how it can affect you it doesn't really affect them in the way they manage the hospitals or that kind of setup in the private clinics then it's quite possible that that kind of problem can be circumvented and it can be very much more efficiently operated. Also, there's local availability as well. Moorfields attracts people from all over the southeast of England, hence we have something around about 5,000 current keratoconus patients, might be more than that in fact. But it's not so good for local availability because you have to trek right into the middle of London. It must be the dustiest street in the whole of London, City Road, I should imagine. Half the time there's scaffolding there and brick dust all over the place. So it's not surprising that most people come in from time to time with nasty abrasions because of foreign bodies under their lenses. In many ways, it's the wrong place to have a hospital. On the other hand, there is the advantage of centralised location, which is to some extent a benefit, and the interaction of the practitioners. But the local availability in private with optometry or medical practice could be utilised to some extent. An improved utilisation of resources generally, I think there is some scope for doing this. I'm not saying that I have a cut and dried solution or a suggestion for doing this, but these are interesting ways forward. Oh, I think uh, before I do this, I'll go back to having a look at some of those contact lens examples which I skipped earlier on. But firstly, do you have anything to add to those comments? Which is, I didn't, nobody said anything, so you must have been entranced or asleep or something else, but what do you, is there any thoughts that you have about that? Mark? Uh, yeah, thanks, Ken. I just have one... Um one question when you're talking about finance um, and you talk uh, how uh, we know how expensive advanced contact lens management is 
more time in the chair, the high cost of the lenses, many lenses over a period of time. But if you're keeping somebody in lenses um, rather than uh, having a graft, what's, what are the finance implications there for, uh, for more fields? For instance, I know that you may post graft, you may be fitting them with lenses, but they may be, they may be in a more stable condition. But are you, make, are you overall, you could overall be making savings for, um, for the hospital by keeping people in lenses? Mark's suggesting, I think correctly, that we can make financial savings by keeping people in contact lenses rather than pushing them into transplants or letting themselves be pushed into transplants. Yes, I completely agree with that. As John was saying, 30 to 50 percent of, of um, post transplants require contact lenses, not necessarily for the only correction, but the optimum correction. And the contact lenses post transplant are not any easier to fit than they were pre transplant. Sometimes, or in fact, quite often, the visual outcome post-transplant is, is better than the visual outcome pre-transplant, but that's a feature of, of, the, the, of the degree of keratoconus when you're, when you're having to have a transplant. The vision is going off at that point, so you would expect the, outcome, the visual outcome to be better post-transplant. But I think, yes, there are some great savings to be made, but because it's... Um, partly because it's dealt with in the hospital, the contact lenses are thought to be just something which can be tagged on to the end of the service, if you like. But it's actually, as you all know, a highly integral part of the service as far as contact lenses is concerned. And it's, as far as we can all see, it's not necessarily being treated like that because there's, as we were saying earlier, lots of weights for lenses, San, uh, Sanjay mentioned right from the outset, the whole thrust of this discussion. Now, can we move all that along faster? Sometimes, some people have more than one type of lens. In fact, this is becoming increasingly common now, that a lot of people use more than one type of lens because contact lenses, all of them, all cause a certain element of problems. Contact lens induce um, uh, complications, not necessarily serious complications. And as John, I'm glad he said this, not me, as John said this morning, nothing like the complications that are possible with transplants. So he saved me saying that as well. But just because I think it's a very important point to make, I'll take the opportunity to reiterate that. But um, certainly the contact lens problems do exist, and so we need to look at alternative types. There is the funding issues. Um, Matt, was it Matt or Gareth? Gareth, were you talking about um, um, aid at work? And they finance things like big screens. The mm. Did they, would they have considered financing your contact lenses um, no. in order to put you back in work uh, in two days rather than the time span that it might have taken? I'm not sure whether you waited for your lens or you were off for a different reason, but if there was a delay because of receiving the lenses, then would your, would your company have been prepared to have contributed towards financing the lenses? Uh, no, as far as the, the company was concerned, I had um, private health care, which I could draw upon if I wanted. But you couldn't, though, could you? I, I couldn't, and what surprised me was the insurance company, the health insurance the company provided is the same as I had when I had my graphs. Back then, in 88, that company actually paid for my graft and my lenses and the management of them. Nearly 18 years on, it's gone. That no longer mm. exists. Um, yeah. I don't know if, that, if that's some change you've noticed within the, the service, both NHS and, and private. Well, actually, I haven't noticed a change at all because I've never noticed any, any um, positive involvement from insurance companies either 18 years ago or now. So you're luckier than, <laughs> luckier than some people were 18 years ago, you could say. But, there is, but uh, aid at work maybe they could help to finance the cost of lenses. Because it doesn't matter whether you have lenses in the private sector or through the hospital eye service. The cost is very much the same. The carpet pile may be a little thinner in the hospital clinics, but apart from that, there's, there's not that much difference in the cost of delivering the service. The, the only way I, I can see that perhaps I could uh, buck the system, as it, as it were, is the healthcare company I work for. We have pharmacists where, so we can actually buy in rival companies' drugs and try and improve on them is, <laughs> is to get one of them to actually uh, knock out a prescription for me so I can uh, at least get them subsidised. <laughs> well, that's got, that has some possibilities. And, of course, there is another little irritating feature about the insurance companies, which is that 
if you declare to them that you have a pre-existing condition, such as keratoconus, then your chances of achieving anything through the insurance company goes from not very much at all to absolutely zero in most cases. So as soon as you're an established keratoconus case, let's say, then you've had it. So we need to either do something about that or we need to find some alternative funding system and firstly recognise that it costs more, like you were off for a, how long? Three months? Three months. So how much did that? Presumably on full pay? Should hope so, under yes. the circumstances. Yeah. But if, so they paid you three months' salary. Now if that delay, if that was because of a bureaucratic delay, that perhaps costs them, well... No idea, but let's say you're on 25,000, that would cost them 8,000. Well, quite a lot of contact lenses for that. Yes, yeah. So, it's, so we need to be looking at alternative funding processes somehow. And we, I don't think we've made any progress along those lines at all so far. The, the only other thing I'd add to that, you say about medical insurance um, don't cover pre-existing conditions. One I found recently is that if I was to change the insurer that protects my mortgage payments, should I be off work for long-term sickness? Those same clauses appear in those, be it credit card, be it mortgage, any financial thing. So it's a case of you then find yourself tied in to existing insurance agreements because at least they're going to cover you. Mm. So it, it, it can, in some cases, prohibit other aspects of your life in terms of financing. Yeah. Insurance companies are definitely not the way to go. There was, um, there was one uh, entry in, in your Keratoconus website recently, which uh, I, so I'm an avid reader of that, as you might have guessed, and one, one, web, one comment said, we should be moving towards the American style of, of insurance cover, and this would be, presumably, the rationale was, this would be better then for people with keratoconus. I totally disagree with that, because even if you do manage to successfully screw something out of the medical insurance companies, they say, oh, we'll pay for this one, but don't know that we'll pay for any more. Trouble is, it's an ongoing process. Contact lenses degrade. You need to review the fitting of them all the time. Sometimes it can be in status quo for a year. Somebody comes back to the practice again, and they're not wearing their lenses for a variety of reasons. And the whole process goes on and on. No less so post-transplant, I might say, but it is a fact that, as you rightly say, the insurance companies, or Mark, I think you said, one of you, that um, the insurance companies will underwrite a, uh, the cost of a transplant without batting an eyelid. And you can draw analogies. There's some interesting things going on at the moment politically. This, um, this government are very keen, surprisingly, it would appear, to be passing off a lot of operations into the private sector. And in fact, this discussion came up quite recently on a uh, radio programme I was listening to. Patricia Hewitt was, was extolling the virtues of this shared arrangement with the private sector and focused in on the cataract situation. Well, cataracts, quite different from keratoconus. There's only one option, which is a surgical intervention. There's nothing else that will deal with a significant cataract. It doesn't necessarily have to be done right away. It's a gradual deterioration, and from month to month, or even year to year, people with cataracts don't necessarily notice that much deterioration. And they're definitely not always at the level of dysfunction that, that non-contact lens wearing non-contact lens wearing keratoconics reach, they can usually do quite well. But the priority, the imperative to operate on cataract patients is absolutely extraordinary. And why is this? It's because every family in the country has an old relative which has a cataract. So the quicker we can do them, the more votes we win at the next election. And it becomes a political feature. Not so the poor keratoconus person who is who's dumped without being able to see anything because they can't get a pair of lenses issued. It's just appalling. Ken, is, is there a wider point, a very much wider point, which is very easy to express in two or three sentences, but much harder to implement? And that's that if you insurers calculate everything based on statistics, usually actuarial figures. Actuaries will look at reports, they'll look at history, they'll calculate things from previous incidents. So unless they're presented with something which will change their thinking on how those things are calculated, and that would have to be some sort of comprehensive study funded God only knows how, uh, looking at the whole economics of the situation, then nothing is actually going to change. Mm -hmm. And I would have thought the same imperatives apply if you're going to look 
at how the NHS addresses management of, of conditions like ours, because they'll be looking at exactly the same sort of features. And so unless you present them with information that shows, for example, that you could run a hybrid service, partly private, partly NHS, and do it much more efficiently, and probably much more cheaply, or certainly for no greater cost, but get people contact lens quicker, um, maybe surgery quicker, and all sorts of other uh, implications. You would have those people in work, you'd have them in education, you'd be saving benefits being paid to them while they're out of work, you'd be saving people losing jobs, their quality of life would go up. It, as I said, it's all very easy to say in a few sentences, but you'd actually have to go back and find a way of, of engineering that situation. Mm. And I think that's where the problem starts. And I think you know that I had hoped today that we would have a health economist and somebody from a health insurer here, but we weren't able to achieve that. And I think that's very much a project for the future. Uh, and I think there is, this is a, a purely personal view based upon very recent experience, it, there is a real role for hybrid sort of treatment, uh, NHS um, uh, private, because uh, last week I was fitted with a scroll lens in the private sector uh, by somebody standing up there for the first time and I went into his practice at 11 o'clock and came out at 5.30 with a completed scleral lens which I now wear 16 hours a day. Um, that would have taken me, I dread to think how many months had I done it with hospitalizer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank I, I've just thoroughly embarrassed him but I think you have to make the point that, that these things can actually be done quickly. I, I can remember being told about a hospital that had the relevant equipment to make certain types of lens. They had the hospital but no technicians to produce them. And they could have been producing them on a two-week cycle but the equipment was in a corridor, so they couldn't make it. Um, the whole thing is a, is a nonsense, and there needs some sort of underlying study to, to attack those points. Yeah. Sorry, I'll get off my hobby horse. Yeah. That, that's great, because you saved me having to say that, and I can have a drink of water while you, <laughs> while you were saying what I, just exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And because there is no political imperative to improve the situation for keratoconus, because the instance is one in two to three thousand, Nobody gives them monkeys, and it's just so bad. And the, the complete reverse should be the case because we're dealing with putting productive people back into the workforce again, productive young people. It affects, as you all know, it affects you from 15 onwards. It, it's not just 15 to 25. There, there are some people that, that start a keratoconus process round about 45 to 50. It's a different manifestation of the condition, but it's still essentially an ectasia and distension, can be secondary, I expect, under certain circumstances. But even so, it still represents a productive group of people. It's interesting to see, actually, that um, the demography of keratoconus people in in the, in the clinics has changed in the time that I've been working there. When I first started at Moorfields, which is in the mid-70s, it was really rare to see anybody in the clinic apart from some of the doctors, who are over 30. So where did they all go, one wonders? Now, 30 years later, there's quite a few of them around about the 50 to 55 mark, but not that many older than that. I see a few people who are a bit older because a few of the old ones wear scleral lenses. But that aside, it's quite uncommon to see pensioners with keratoconus in the clinics. But the demography has certainly changed from the time I started to now, and that's partly because of the development of gas permeable materials for contact lenses. Contact lenses were something of an infancy in the 60s and 70s, and they really came, to, to, came of age, if you like, in the early 80s. And since then, nothing, it hasn't changed that much since the early 80s. The, the materials reached a ceiling point in development at about that time, and they became very highly gas permeable. And this improved the quality of, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the lenses, the tolerance and everything, virtually overnight and so therefore the people who were not coming back presumably because they'd given up their contact lens wear in the 70s it was just too difficult and they just accepted their lot are now coming back into back into the clinic but they're coming back as older people and so we're looking at a different pathology level which is 25 years of, of uh, contact lens induced corneal pathology with keratoconus wearers so it's quite a different pathology level and we certainly do see some people with uh, with changes which have happened after that time. So, so we're looking at not just new contact lens wearers which come and a few of them stay on, but not any long-standing wearers. Now it's different. That's why I said earlier it's quite a useful thing to be able to offer alternatives. And there are some alternatives as far as lenses are concerned, and they all have their own crop of advantages and disadvantages. There's no particular reason why you shouldn't run one with another. And you could even extend this immediacy of the supply to that level where you can provide everybody with what is a, a reasonable option and they can go away with 
Wellington boots for stomping around on a farm and ballet shoes for dancing, as it were. Two different types of shoes, two different types of lenses. And I see absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be moving towards that. The cost of lenses, whatever type of lens, even lenses which are high expensive items, compared to the total cost, it's a drop in the ocean. It's really insignificant. And, but we make such a big issue out of, oh, no, we can't order that lens because our budget's run out for this year. Or oh, we can't order that one because it doesn't come out of our budget. It comes out of your budget because you don't receive the treatment promptly. But it could all be done so much faster. And Mike's, um, Mike will have to look at his email when he gets back because I actually diverted an email which I received from the health economics people who I was trying to communicate with. And they said that, um, oh, well, maybe we can have a look at this. They couldn't unfortunately come to this meeting, but um, they did at least send me a message just the other day to say that they would be interested in investigating it. And so um, we've sort of arranged, a, not exactly a date, but we've got a, a go-ahead to say that we're going to talk to the professor at the university and see what we can do. So we've made a little bit of progress with that, even though the health economics people didn't come along today. But that's my thoughts on what you should be doing and how you should be focusing your attention on, on what to do. It's very difficult for us to do it on your behalf because we go to the clinics, we do what turns up. I don't even know who's coming in next week, so I I've, don't really, or I really have the opportunity to prepare for somebody coming in next week, and sometimes I get caught out by that one, because if the lenses haven't turned up, oh, oh, it's horrible, that is, when patients are there and lenses aren't, but I just don't get around to checking it, because it's not my job to, to make things happen other than that half-hour session in the clinic. Freddie? Right. Well, well you're, you, you've hit it on the head there, really. Your MP, I think that is the right person to address. What, uh, on quite a few occasions, I've had people come into my practice and we've, um, we've gone ahead with something because they want to circumvent the system. And I've said to them, uh, and they're trying to extract something from their private medical insurance company. So I've said to them, well, for a start, I'll back you up if you give me a contact name and number, etc. And then if you want to take it further, if you want to write to your MP, I'll back it up to your MP as well. And I think this is the way that you should proceed with it. That's absolutely right, yes. So that's the next way forward. I would actually... Um, I would hasten to point out here, by the way, that I, I don't want you all to think that... I believe the, the service offered by the British eye, eye service, the hospital eye service, is a bad one. On the contrary, I think it's absolutely top flight. Well, with respect, why I ask the question, the service I've had has been fantastic. Mm. And I don't want any personal criticism to be the client's fault. Mm. Um, but the Yeah. That's right. Yes, well, hospitals are making attempts all the time to streamline that kind of bureaucracy so they avoid having overlap and wasted appointments. But what I meant was, I also don't want to fall foul of being, having a finger pointed at me for being critical of, especially Morfields, because Morfields has given me unbelievable support over, over three decades when I've been tinkering with lenses and manufacturing, doing everything, and it's not been very productive all the time, I must say. So Morfields has been absolutely brilliant, and the fact that they do it and deliver the service is a fantastic credit to them them. In other countries, you might criticise them for keeping people waiting months for issue of lenses, but the reason for those delays is because they don't have free appointments. Now, you could say, create more appointments. Well, that means bringing in more staff, and that means more allocation of funding to that particular activity. Well, they say, we've got a budget, we've got retinal detachments to deal with, we have glaucoma. These are immediate today priorities. I'm not saying that keratoconus isn't a priority in its own right, but it's not an urgent today emergency. And so it does have to take its place with everything else. But what is not recognised is it's uniquely a group which could be dealt with quickly, or at least the non-invasive options could be dealt with without delay. And it just isn't. And it's not the hospital's fault that this is the case. It's because it's not recognised, and this is what we need to change. Well, 
oh, I don't think that new computer system will do anything to help our cause at all. I don't really see why it should. It's, it will be useful in interaction when there is, there is um, joint prescribing and that sort of thing, but there's only one reason why there's unnecessary delays. There's, the delays are because it's not properly funded and it's not the hospital's fault that it's not funded. It's somebody else's fault that it's not funded. But I don't think an elaborate uh, electronic system will make any difference whatsoever. That's a smoke screen. Do you think part of the problem is the sort of obsession with targets? Because you're talking about managing the condition, and it's very difficult to fit that type of thing within a target, whereas, of course, you, you can fix surgical procedures and targets. You, you can say, we've done so many corneal grafts, we've done so many uh, mm. surgical procedures, but you can't really count managing. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, it's about three quarters of the problem, in, that, in fact. Uh, <coughs> yes, you're absolutely right. And I feel like a negative statistic at Moorfields because my job is largely to keep people off the operating table. I'm never going to do a corneal transplant. You'll be all pleased to hear that's a very fortunate thing because you don't want to let me near you with any of that sort of gear. But it's, it, my job is the opposite. From this, as long as I've been listening to health secretaries, the first one I recall is Virginia Bottomley. They've all said, the health service is very healthy because we've carried out 30,000 operations this week. That's why they latch on to cataracts. You can do 20 in an afternoon if you want to, so you can bolster up your number of cataract operations, have a massive impact. But with keratoconus, it's no bad thing to keep people waiting a little longer in some respects for the operation because you have a long rehab period anyway, and the, imper the imperative to do it is not that great. It's more important to make sure that all of the other options are looked at. And the longer you leave it, in some respects, the more you appreciate the benefits of the outcome. Same applies with cataract as well. You can leave that so that the visual acuity goes down a little bit, then when you do the cataract, your improvement is so much better. And, but you can, it doesn't matter so much leaving it with, with the cataracts. But, the, op, but the, the corneal transplant, the waiting, the imperative to do that, I know people want to get on with it, but because it's such a long, protracted business, another few weeks waiting for the surgery is, is not so important as eliminating those few weeks waiting for the non-invasive options to be, to be fully looked at. But yes, it, it's, it's the targets. We have to have a certain number carried out. So it's, it, and we don't feature in that all that well when it comes to contact lens management. This is not against any of the UK optometrists or ophthalmologists, but where would we stand if we wanted to go, say, to Germany or France to get treatment under the EU? And does that then reflect back on the Would the health service then actually look up if we start to say we Well, the, um, yeah, the. the The, 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 quest right. the question was, can we implement more of the facility of Europe to speed things up or improve the situation? Yeah, just, just, as a, just as a key to getting improvements over here, because if, if enough people made that impression by using the services over here, then they would have been able to do Yes. But I think the same argument would apply. It depends on the country. In, in some European countries, there's very little health insurance contribution towards contact lenses. Under an EU arrangement, I should imagine that surgery would be carried out on a quid pro quo basis. And we would do some, they would do some, and we may well be looking towards harmonisation. But I know that, for example, in Germany, they won't contribute very much at all to the, to the management of contact lenses. So it becomes quite difficult to fit people up with contact lenses on the continent. In actual fact, I think we're pretty well ahead of the field, to be honest with you. Um, Scandinavia is very good, but that's because they have, I don't know why, but they seem to have a very much more accommodating insurance system in Scandinavia for some reason. But Germany, not so. I don't know about the other countries. Italy, it's... Well, yeah, there is that. And... 
Well, yes, there, I suppose there is that problem, yeah. yeah. In Italy, there is, um, you know, I, I alluded earlier to the optometrist not knowing whether to have a three-year course or a one-year course, and as a consequence, the optometry profession in Italy is very feeble. It is hopeless, really. The consequence of that is that in Italy, there's more corneal surgery carried out per capita than any other European country. In the US, which has high availability of corneas because of their system of taking, trans taking material rather than, asking, rather than waiting to be told you can have it, they carry out something like 40,000 transplants per annum. We carry out about 4,000 per annum. Their population is about 250 million, ours is 50 million. So you're looking at twice the number per capita in the US cornea transplants than compared to the UK transplant. And part of that is because we actually make it happen through the British Health Service for contact lens supply. And that's, uh, I, think, I don't think there's any, any other explanation for it, quite honestly. I'm really pleased we had that discussion. That was, if you else want to contribute, um, I, I can go on for, oh, we've got to go soon, haven't we? Did Ken, you want to Ken, you, you could go on for another couple of days, but yeah. unfortunately we were... Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> would, would you like me to um, show some of those pictures of, of contact lens fits? I think it's a bit spurious to require them, quite honestly. I it's, think so, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not going to achieve very much. Save, save it to say that... Mm. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Oh, how much goes undiagnosed? Um, 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 the, oh, how, and, and, how, and what about the... Because uh, one of my pet theories is that a lot of dyslexia is low-grade keratoconus that is undiagnosed. Because you may, until you look yeah. at a piece of paper with words on it, you don't realise you've got an eyesight problem because if you haven't got any of the other things associated with it and mm. you're managing okay... So, yeah. I mean, I should have developed this in, as a teenager. In fact, I think I did, but I was, I was always fobbed off by opticians when I went for eye tests because I didn't come down far enough on the chart. But I've always had problems here and there, and it's only until yeah. I get to being I, I, 37 before it, it really kicks in because of display screen equipment at work. Mm. I don't think there's a big problem with underdiagnosing keratoconus now. I think there was, say, 15, 20 years ago, but not now, because schools are very clued up to, to uh, detecting kids who are not functioning. And because there's the risk of, of um, finger-pointing at schools who don't detect poor performers in the classroom, they look for reasons why they might to hide behind. And in my practice, for example, I'm always seeing children who have been referred by school teachers when there's absolutely zero wrong with them. And this is an overkill reaction to avoid the finger pointing exercise. So I dare say there's a few people undiagnosed, but I don't think there's great numbers of undiagnosed keratoconics anymore because it comes at an age when um, either young adolescents or older, older people up to 45, it comes at an age when with a one or two exceptions, the groups are articulate in their own right. So they tell you that they're not seeing very well. And it's fairly easy to be suspicious, at least of keratoconus, when somebody comes into your room because you say, well, how are you getting on? I can't see in the distance. Oh, but you can read well then, can you? So, well, only if hold it right up there. So it's, you can tell straight away when somebody is likely to have keratoconus by what they say. And the diagnostic procedures for... Uh, for identifying keratoconus are actually pretty straightforward. You can, you can see it straight away with equipment, handheld equipment, which has been used from time immemorial, which you just shine off the retina. You can see a distinctive shadow in the pupil. It's so easy to diagnose a significant keratoconus. There might be one or two people with low-grade keratoconus, but they can largely be corrected with specs, and they may say, oh, things are a bit hazy but I really find it a bit hard to believe that there's a lot of people with serious advanced keratoconus which are just falling by the wayside. Sorry, if they're low grade and they're corrected by specs and they're not told it's keratoconus, yeah, but if they're being the corrected... incidence is actually higher. Oh, yes, I see, yes, I, I take my, your point. My, my, yes. my local optician wasn't interested in me unless I had a visible cone, and with you saying about the, um, the not trained... And it's, I've got a friend who's a GP. I'm the only person he's met. My GP 
I'm the only character Koenig he's met in, mm. his, in, in most of his career. My, it was picked up by a, um, a retiring optician with two practices in, in Manchester and Macclesfield. Lots of people, and she'd seen four in her career. Oh, she would, then your doctor. Doctors very often don't encounter a keratoconus. But what were your symptoms when you first presented with keratoconus? Well, I've been treated with sinusitis for several years because I didn't have a problem unless it was with display screen equipment. Yes, and but I what was, was your visual symptoms when you had that keratoconus diagnosis made? Sinusitis. No, visual symptoms. What, what, how did it affect I went, your well, sight? I went, the whole family went for an eye test and I went along with them so I could try, I could try prior, the glasses on. Prior to the appointment, were you having any difficulty seeing anything? Lots of difficulty, but I've been for eye test and it wasn't picked up. And you came out of the eye tests feeling that they hadn't detected yes, it? for 20 years. Yeah, well that was how long ago? Four years ago now. Four years ago. I'm a bit surprised to find that, that that was the case. What was the upshot? They referred you to the hospital? Yeah. Yes, well, at least they referred you to the hospital because they couldn't deal with the situation. So you referred to the hospital, which presumably they did diagnose it and yeah, deal with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's no the usual since. format anyway. But my, my, my point is that you were saying about the incidence of keratoconus. With what's happened with me, I'm convinced that the incidence is actually higher but that's not picked up, so you're not getting the funding that you want to treat the keratoconus you want, because there's a lot of it out there that isn't picked up, yes. because opticians don't see very many of us, and it's passed away as you've got to see a visible cone. Yes, you, you could well be right. It, it could be helpful in that respect to have a higher pickup rate for keratoconus, but I think you'll find that the ones which would be added to the total would be fairly well managed in the early stages with spectacle corrections and not contact lenses. I think it becomes only clinically significant when you need to use contact lenses in order to rectify it. When it's, when it's with glasses, yes, I appreciate that it's there and you can detect it, but if it's correctable with glasses, it's at a lower level, which doesn't really, it doesn't affect you so much. So it's not such but an it's issue. Not, mine's, mine's not really correctable with glasses, but it's, I cope with it. Mm. But you could well be better off with glasses because glasses are a lot easier to... Not with drip. trips and falls. You, you, all you have to do is put them on and give them a clean with a tissue and you can see fairly well. Contact lens, you've got to clean them, put them in, find you've got a bit of dust under them, take yes, them out, wash yes. them again, put them back in again and all that. So it, glasses are a lot easier, so you should crack open a bottle of champagne if you can see quite well with your glasses and not have to be referred to the contact lens clinic. <laughs> One way of looking at it. Gareth? Yes. Yes. That's a very good point. Um, Gareth was just pointing out that people, non keratoconic people, that is, are presenting in huge numbers to have their corneas manipulated to correct the myopia. If you present and you're keratoconic, then provided they spot it, which they, are, they usually do because they're really focused in on spotting keratoconics because it's a bit of a litigation issue. You operate on, a kerat on what was a keratoconus and I think you wouldn't have much of a leg to stand on. So they really do look hard to find it. Therefore, they go and look for minuscule keratoconus, if you like with completely insignificant characters, and then thereby drawing attention to it. And there is, as Gareth says, striking the fear of God into people. Is not, it, it is completely unnecessary to strike the fear of God into people about keratoconus. It's completely wrong to presume that it's going to go really bad. As much keratoconus doesn't progress as does progress. So I don't think that it's right to predict pro progression of keratoconus. So therefore you plan for what you can and can't do according to the situation as you find it now, not how it might be if the keratoconus gets worse. There's one or two sensible caveats that, like if you're going to go into medicine, for example, you might care to avoid 
becoming really f uh, specialised in jobs looking down microscopes because you see all the ghosty images and you don't know whether you're looking at a blood cell or a ghost image. So that would be an exception. But generally speaking, if you can do it now, then you should plan, you should budget for being able to do that, whatever you're doing, in 40 years' time. If the situation changes, then you deal with it as best possible. So therefore, the, the laser clinics are contributing to picking up an extra few numbers of, of keratoconus patients which are insignificant. Ken, we've got a question over here. Mm -hmm. um, it would seem to me that what you're suggesting is that this organisation needs to be a pressure group, which to some extent it is. My feeling that, that, that I'm getting is that there's nothing MPs like better than saving money. And that seems to be the suggestion. We've got people with keratoconus who, if they were treated quickly and effectively, could be back at work. Now, what I would suggest is that as an organization, we learn from something like Christian Aid, where I regularly get postcards to send off to MPs. You've got an organization of a people of maybe, I don't know, a thousand people. If every MP at the same time receives the same sort of information about this, you could trigger some sort of change with the idea this is a way of saving money. This is a way of people not having to be off work two years, but could be back at work quickly if we dealt with contact lenses very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that would seem to me a very standard thing. Now, if you do it piecemeal, it won't work. It needs to be a pressure group. And the way I'd suggest doing it is for the organisation to create a letter that is then sent out to members, coordinated, and every member hits every MP at one time with that message. This is a way of saving money. It seems such an obvious thing. I think you've got something there that Mike might want to take on board. <laughs> yes. I'm tempted to say, what do you think of that, Anne? Um, because I'm not quite sure how to... <laughs> um, I think that's probably a question that's addressed to us as an organising committee rather than, than Ken, although he's quote, posed effectively a question to the group. Um, yes, uh, there is a role for a pressure group. We're walking something of a tightrope between being a pressure group of sorts and also uh, working in cooperation with... with uh, the medics and hospitals in one place or another. And I guess sooner or later we might have to make a decision as to which we really are. Um, but I would say one practical point, and it comes down to funding and numbers, and that is that as many points as there are, we could write uh, a chain letter from everybody or something of that sort on. Um, uh, we would require a similar number of people to draft the letters, put the things together and fund it. And um, it has to be remembered that we have no staff there's only us and we all work full time. So uh, it would need us to put together some sort of funding proposal, get funding and organize ourselves in a rather different way if we were to function as a pressure group. I've got no, no feelings against it really and I can see a, a huge role for it, but I think it's very difficult for us to make that step as we stand because I don't think we're equipped to cope with it. Um, I'm quite happy to stand up in front of people and make a fool of myself and argue cases. I'm quite happy to sign any letters that are reasonable. But I think we've got to be quite careful where we stand as a group to avoid damaging any good work we might have done in terms of working with the health service and other people. So I think it is a tightrope, but I take the point and I think it's a darn good one. If I could just add to it, Mike said, um, in a way, it's, it's quite difficult for us as a group to, we, to try and point both ways because in a, we, so as a self-help group, we, were, we started off by um, uh, getting people with kar karatokonus together and that's now developed to a point where we're in a position where we, our membership is upwards of a thousand and we, uh, you know, lobbying is uh, a, a kind of... Uh, uh, logical next step, but our resources are still spread very, very thinly. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to organise things like this, to get the website going and so on. But we have been involved in work where we uh, work uh, with more fields in terms of talking to them about some of the, the issues that Ken's talked about in terms of uh, delivery, about the, the point of access for people who go to more fields. And we've, we have regular meetings. Um, and there with, with the, the people that run uh, clinic, uh, clinic 4, the contact lens clinic. Um, 
we've also been lobbied on the issue about uh, solutions. The solutions is a, is a, is a, is a big, uh, I mean, the, the contact lens solutions. Um, it, it's a big issue. It's been a big issue for us in terms of uh, um, it, it's, it, it didn't come up in, Ken, in, in Ken, was, Ken was saying, but the, the cost of solutions is a, is a, is a big issue to uh, contact lens wearers. And, and as more and more fields reduce the, the, um, the, the length of time they'd, they'd uh, uh, give their patients solutions, then it really, really hit people in a hard way. So we, we tried to do some lobbying on that, on that issue. So there are certainly areas where we can, you know, we, we can try and bring our influence to bear. Um, but it, it's, it's a tough job for us, and if, if people want to you know, help with ideas and so on, then we're kind of welcome, um, uh, we welcome that, so that we can sort of uh, um, look, at, look at different ways of working. Um, it's probably, it, it's, it's, it's half past four, so we don't, we don't want to get kicked out yet, so uh, um, I don't want to cut Ken off, but, if, <laughs> but I will. <laughs> Rosemary, Rosemary um, had one question. Have, if we have one last question from Rosemary before we, uh, before we wind up. Hi. As a comment on the postcards issue, in general, if you're approaching people you want to be on your side, standard letters and postcodes don't work. They tend to alienate people. It's far better to give people a briefing sheet but persuade them to write their own thought-out, polite letter. It doesn't have to be a work of art or whatever. It is a real personal letter to their own MP. That's far more effective. The point about the mass postcard campaigns is they have two points of two point. They can have two points of usefulness. One is to raise the awareness of the people you are persuading to send the postcards. Um, the other one is that it can be useful if you're sending the postcards not to somebody who you hope will support you, but somebody who's an opponent. But even then, writing individual letters is better. Um, going back to the question of the funding and the getting people back to work. Um, well, not only is being able to go out and lead your life and get back to work good for the people, um, but if you don't, if they don't go back to work or if they haven't, can't get a job in the first place, then I, as a insurance payer, a national insurance payer, and somebody who pays my tax when I earn enough to pay paying tax, my tax and insurance and everybody else in the room in the same position is paying for them to be out of work on benefit, on sick pay, invalidity benefit, DLA, whatever it is, um, when it could be paying far less to get them set up with contact lenses and fluids and back to work and benefiting the economy and paying tax and stamp themselves. Um, can I add one quick more question? <laughs> um, as somebody who would rather not ma spend all my time managing my medical conditioning but, conditioning but managing my life, can I ask if there's been any progress or any advances on dealing with for, for, for those of us whose main problem is glare? Is there any advance in dealing with the glare problem? Well, I'm not so sure that um, <coughs> that's going to be very successful. The glare is probably due to scatter within the cornea as much as anything else. We deal with the topographical problems of, of light refraction with contact lenses, and we deal with that fairly satisfactorily. But if we've achieved what we can achieve with that, then there still remains glare problems. It's not obvious how you address that one with any great optimism, I must say. Roger, got any suggestions on the glare? Well, polar, yes, uh, Matt's suggesting Polaroid sunglasses. Polaroid sunglasses are, um, well, no, but, but they, are, they, are, they do work because they cut out light in a, in a particular meridian and, they, and reflected light is in one meridian. Mm. That's, that's a very simple solution, but it, there's, <coughs> yes, you're absolutely right. It's, it's only a partial solution, and there isn't really a solution to it. It's, the, it's an imperfect correction at the best of times, and we can only do the best we can. Sorry, can I, can I cut mm. in there? We do need actually to draw things to a close uh, now. We, we're going to have, um, I'd like to thank Ken, first of all, for his presentation. Um, thank you. <laughs> That there are some who suggested in the Keratokona script that Ken ought to be canonised. Um, there are some surgeons, I think, who suggest that he ought to be scalped. But 
one way or another, he's a stalwart. He's always supported us, and so we're very grateful he's here uh, and will hopefully continue to be so and uh, speak at further conferences. So thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Mike. Um, while I've got